A tremendous Monday to you. What's up? We are broadcasting live from the O'Reilly Auto Parts studio. Hello. I am Jim Rome, O'Reilly Auto Parts, better parts, better prices every day. Hey, now, how is everybody? How was the weekend? What is up? All right, let me lay it out for you. I'm going to start this show like I do every single show. I'm going to lay out what I have for you and what I need from you. Let's do it both. First, your telephone number, 1-800-636-8686. We're in the middle of summer. I feel like taking phone calls. I feel like getting some phone calls in here before I bust out for a vacation in a few weeks. So let's get the ball rolling. 1-800-636-8686. It is toll-free. Call me right now. That number is good everywhere in the U.S. and in Canada. Again, 1-800-636-8686. You can email us at Rome, R-O-M-E, at Habitate.com. Follow me on Twitter at Jim Rome and go to Facebook.com slash Jim Rome. Things I want to hit today, obviously the Open Championship. I've got thoughts on Rory. He now has three legs of the Grand Slam. He's only 25. Got himself paid. Got his old man paid. Looked great doing it. Not as dominant as he was earlier in the week. However, he didn't have to get it done. Tiger Woods, apparently honks, is not back. That's what I try to tell you after the first round. A nice round, a 69 that could have been maybe a 67 or even a 66. It's just one round. And he's far from back. If Tom Watson is shooting lower than him, safe to say he is not back. So I'll get to that a little bit later on. Talk some football. Bill's head coach, Doug Marone, joins me at 40 past hour number one. We've got a lot of things to talk to him about. Coming up in hour number two, Ned Coletti. In hour number three, Buck Showalter. So some good baseball interviews. Talk a little football. Talk some golf. Let's get at this thing. I'm looking for you now. 1-800-636-8686. It is Rory's world. Everybody else right now is just hacking in it. He's 25. He ripped the jug. And now he is a single green jacket short of a career grand slam at 25. And the Augusta Taylors can go right ahead and start cutting that thing right now because him rocking it is a no-doubter. It's not a question of if. It's a matter of when. And he didn't win his. No, he didn't do it on Sunday when he tapped in. He did it Saturday when he piped in two eagles to close the show. It's for a closing eagle. Eagle! Looks good. They should have just filled the jug with Guinness right then and there and let him play Sunday hungover. It would not have mattered. He ends up going wire to wire, and that Sunday 71 was not a stumble, but rather just what he needed. No, he was not freaky good like he was on Thursday and Friday, but again, he didn't need to be. He did what he had to do to finish it. So if you were waiting for Rory to start gripping, stop breathing, and drop a sequel to his 2011 Masters meltdown, then you were begging. That was not going to happen. I'm not sure at this point that he has a collapse like that in him. Not anymore. While Bubba and Hefty and the cat struggled, Rory punked it. He's massive off the tee. He's free of his lady. He is the face of Nike. And he made that look relatively easy. And again, although he had a tough, tough year and a half, if he can keep it together on and off the track, we're talking about a career grand slam by his mid-20s, and then one of the best ever to pick up the bats. That good. Hall of Fame good. Tiger Woods good. Jack Nichols good. I mean, that good if he's right. Enjoy the adult beverages, champ. He actually went Jaeger in the jug. Why? Why does anybody do anything? Because he can. That's a very aggressive play. Jaeger in the claret jug. So he was awesome. He got it done. And now looking at a career grand slam, if he can win at Augusta. And there's no doubt that's going to happen. I bet anything. Never mind his old man and his friends betting a decade out that he'd win that tournament by the time he's 26. I bet anything right now he's going to get that green jacket. And sooner than later, he'll have that career slam. I mentioned that he had had a tough year and a half. And he did. On the course and off the course. You know, it's understandable. The guy's so young. And so gifted and so talented and everything was moving so quickly. When you're that young and you have that much success and that much attention and you're under the microscope, man, that's tough. 
That's tough. It got away from him, and you can see how it could. But he says now his passion for golf is back, and he is focused. I really find my passion again for golf. You know, not again, not not that it ever dwindled, but it's really, you know, it's my, you know, it's what I think about when I get up in the morning. It's what I think about when I go to bed. You know, I, I just want to be, you know, the best golfer that I can be. Hey, look, it's, and I'm not being funny when I say this, it's not easy to be that talented and that famous and that wealthy and have those kind of responsibilities and be that young. And I think that crown did not fit very well for a while, but I think it does now. I think the guy's arrived. He's here. Even that choker, Sergio Garcia, played lights out. I mean, he gave him a run. He pulled him in, too. And I thought to myself, uh-oh. And remember, Sergio was the guy who said, I'm just not going to win a major. I don't have it in me. I'm not that guy. He damn near did. Ricky Fowler coming up too short again, and in a good way. So we've got all that, and then we've got Tiger Woods. Oh, Eldrick. He had himself a weekend, didn't he? Opened that tournament with a first-round 69 and looked pretty damn good doing it. And then he closed it by finishing in 69th place. What would all of you honks, what would all of you honks have said when after that first round you were coming in here like, he's back, he's back, own it, Romy's back? I mean, even I couldn't have said at that point, and I did say he's not back, but even I would not have said, let me tell you something, not only is he not back, he will finish in 69th behind Tom Watson. I wouldn't have even said that, but that's what he did. Opened up that tourney by shooting low and dropping JC bombs, and then closed it by dropping F bombs. Jesus Christ. Guys. And trust me, when this cat, the cat, wasn't spraying obscenities, he was spraying shots everywhere. Finishing 23 strokes off the lead and five shots back of a 64 year old Tom Watson, the Ryder Cup captain. Is not the way to make that Ryder Cup team, Eldrick. And if you're basing that roster spot off this weekend, instead of using the captain's pick on Tiger, Watson ought to call his own number. Back. Come on, back? That was Tiger's worst performance in a major where he finished all 72 holes. Let me repeat that. Worst performance in a major where he finished all 72 holes. Never has that Sunday read looked more ridiculous than when Tiger was already finishing up more than an hour before Rory teed off. And that's why I told you all, all you honks, to pump your brakes on. He's back. He's back. After that first round 69. I mean, you've got to feel even more ridiculous yourself than he looks. Listen, the fact that he's even out there three and a half months after back surgery is pretty impressive especially when most felt that he wouldn't play again this year. I'll give him that. That was impressive. But what he did out there was not. And right now, this guy is nowhere near ready to win anything, much less his 15th major. So stop crowing about the return of the cat. I will let you know when he's back. He's not back yet. So for him to say, oh, I wouldn't be here unless I thought I could win, is a joke. And for you to say that you thought he was back after one round was a joke. He's played six competitive rounds since getting back surgery. And I think for him, and I would expect him to say nothing other than I expect to make that team, I expect to be a Ryder Cupper, the way he's playing right now, you can't justify it. The guy had back surgery. He's busted up. He's 38. He's not going to throw a switch. He's going to have to show up awfully big next two times out. This email reads, Dear MLB, you've had a fun season. Something that was somewhat talked about since we were on vacation. Now we've started to open up camps. Time for spring training. Fax us on who wins your championship since you still haven't discovered email. As we quote every year from our favorite musician, time to die. Time to die. Sign the National Football League. More training camps opening. More Raj Goodell telling MLB to sit on it. Sit on it. Who was that Mrs. C? Is Mrs. C now? Emailing my program? Fonzie, sit on it. Oh, no, she didn't. Oh. Remember the time Mrs. C told Fonzie Roy to sit on it? Sit on it. Oh, no, she didn't. That was something back in the day. 
All right, so in addition to that, baseball, I actually do want to talk about a couple of things. Number one, the code, man. The code the code has never been more annoying than it is right now after Colby Lewis lit up Colby Rasmus. And what are the chances of two guys named Colby being in the middle of a code breaker? I'll have that for you. This guy's so out of hand. How many people are there named Colby in the entire world? Like 10? And two of them were in the middle of something involving the violation of baseball's sacred code? But Lewis, it's almost comical. It's almost like he tried to be funny when in laying out how the other Colby violated the code. It's code. It's a joke. Also, Fernando Rodney, I guess breaking out your arrow and directing it at the opposing dugout in a non-save situation. Well, I mean, it was a save situation, but not yet. If that's not a violation of the code, I don't know what is, and I'm glad he did it. I'm glad he did it. And baseball's got to lighten up. We need more of these incidents. Baseball would be a lot more popular. Also, I want to talk about Andre Karolinko. Andre Karolinko took a run at Jason Kidd, said that the pressure was too much for him in New York, couldn't handle it or didn't want to. You know, it'd be awesome if somebody other than Andre Karolinko said it, if somebody other than somebody at the end of the bench had said it. I mentioned the Bills. Marcel Darius fails a conditioning test. My man, if there was one guy in the entire NFL who should have shown up and passed the conditioning test, it's the guy who bounced his Jaguar off a tree. I don't think he's getting it. Doug Marone joins us later on. Rex Ryan in the news. Rob Ryan in the news. Rob Ryan's in the news because somebody snapped a picture of him in an airport with three pizzas and a stuffed animal. Pretty awesome. 1-800-636-8686. It has been 45 years since Lance Armstrong walked on the moon. Yes, I said it. I saw it in a newspaper, and if it's in a newspaper, it must be true, right? Not as many years since Buzz Aldrin punched some kook in the face for stalking him and saying that he never walked on the moon. Truly one of the finer moments in the history of this country. All of that coming up. This email says, Good day, Jimmy. Three words. Straight cash, homie. Straight cash, homie. Signed, Roar's old man, Tom in Detroit. War Rome laying action right now that his son will win the World Cup by age 26. Man, I would need some serious odds on that. I'd have to do better at 500 to 1. If I'm going to lay money on my kid winning the World Cup by age 26, I'm going to need odds of like 5 million to 1. Somebody do the math for me. If I put down 10 grand at 5 million to 1, how much money will I make? Because if I can get those odds, I'm pulling my kid out of baseball and putting him into soccer. In fact, I'm pulling my kid out of school and putting him into soccer. Of course, I'm going to have to move because I know we're not going to win it here. Let's see. I could probably move. I'll probably go to Brazil, Germany, France, Ghana. Netherlands would not be bad. Ghana would be pretty cool. If there's a sports book out there that will give me 5 million to 1 odds on my son winning the World Cup 26, I'll lay 10 grand on that right now, pull him out of baseball, pull him out of school, and the Romes will move to Ghana and the jungle will originate there. Ghana. Why is it always Ghana? Because I found somebody to give me 5 million to 1 odds that my kid will win the World Cup. There you go. 1 800 636 86. 8-6. 8-6. Let's do this. Phone lines are wide open. Thousands of people looking for home security get ripped off every single day. And the home security industry wants you to believe that that is your only option. Either that or get robbed. <laughs> Hilarious, right? Because they're the ones robbing you. You don't need to worry about actual robbers. Worry about those in the industry that are jamming you. Hordes of salesmen out there trying to scare you into signing one of their long-term contracts. Then you get stuck scratching huge checks month after month and there's no way out it is robbery by contract it will cost you thousands but there's a better way to protect your home and your family simply safe home security simply safe has no contracts none you get 24 7 protection trained professionals watching over your home ready to call the police for only 14.99 per month that's less than a third of what most companies will charge you for the same exact service simply safe 
will protect your home, your family. Do it the smart way. Visit simplysafehome.com. Go right now for an exclusive 10% offer, simplysaferome.com. That's simplysaferome.com. It is the best value proposition I know, simplysaferome.com. Are you still not an O Rewards member yet? Visit orewards.com and become an O'Reilly O Rewards member today. Start earning $5 back on every $150 you spend. O'Reilly Auto Parts, better parts, better prices every day. I am the walrus tweets at Jim Rome, quote, in light of Rory's dad making bank on a future bet, I'd like to lay down 500 bucks on Mike in Indy's firstborn winning the 2044 smack off. It's not bad. It's just a matter of somebody taking the action. Speaking of I am the walrus, I am the walrus was the rare guy who came off Twitter onto the phones and succeeded in doing so. Lance, my best advice to you, shut up and stick to what you're really good at. Namely, putting up missing cat posters and making gravy volcanoes with your mashed potatoes. Now, clones, I know what you're thinking. Everybody does that. Yeah, but not all of us eat dinner at 3.30 when we already have our pajamas on. But don't worry. Well, that was sort of abrupt. Point being here, Joaquin tried it before him. Joaquin is famous for the MMA wars. And I've been on Joaquin. Come on, Joaquin. Get on the phones. Get on the phones. You're a great emailer, but I need great callers. Get on the phone. And he did, and it was so-so. This guy heard the same thing and thought, I can do better than that. I've got a little bit of run as a tweeter. I think I'll take my shot on the phones. And he did great. The walrus did great. Anybody else? Maybe you listen. Maybe you never call. That's fine. Take your shot. Make an name for yourself. Get in here. Hey, Rome. Jaeger in the jug? Why not just drop some natty light in it? And use all of his trophies to play beer pong. Come on, Rory. You're 25. Stop drinking like you're 19. Sign Nick and the Natty. Come on, man. You make it sound like he dropped some Goldschlager in that. Then again, 25 probably is a little bit old for uh, the Jaeger. But then again, I really don't care what he puts in it. Bartles and James. The Slogger. Jaeger. Whatever. You win that thing, you drink whatever the hell you want. Dear Jim, did you hear about that bet Rory's dad placed for him to win the Open by age 26? Regards, Jerome Bettis is from Detroit. Rome keeps his lettuce tight. And Tower Hansborough likes to hustle. Mike in Chicago, non-seven wood user. Actually, I've grown my lettuce out for quite some time. Mike in Chicago, non-seven wood user, Ward. KB... Appearing on the real world when it re returns to Chicago next year. Hey, KB, let's talk about that for a minute. That's not a bad idea at all. Good morning, Jim. Good morning, Kyle. So, the real world, when you were first on the real world Chicago, that was what, 02? It was 2001 that we taped, 02 aired. Yeah. Okay, so is this thing coming back to Chicago next year? Yeah, you know, I got a phone call like a last week from someone with the Chicago Tribune. And said, oh, we'd love to speak to you. And I'm like, why do I feel like they're not, they don't want my take on, like, the Bulls or the Bears? <laughs> oh, they don't. No, they didn't. Sure enough, uh, that program is coming back to my home, my uh, native city, and they wanted to know my thoughts looking back 13 years later. And did you do the interview? Yeah, I did. It actually ran in Red Eye Magazine and the Tribune or something like that. I didn't that. see yeah. that. Yeah, it's because it was basically down, boiled down to, like, some blurb in the corner, dude. You wouldn't have seen it. All right, so it's like... Kind of a stretch that thing out a little sure. bit. What are your thoughts of that going back, of that show going back to Chicago? Well, my thoughts coming off of Mike's email is that I certainly will not be joining them. Um, Would they be asking? Uh, no, but if they were, what they used to ask is they they try to bring back people on those like uh, challenges, like the the sort of sideshow they have where people go to Mexico and they do obstacle courses and compete, and you can like make money or win a key. Is that the reunion like that. show? We'll, we'll bring you back. We're not going to sit down and talk about what it was like. We will bring you back and humiliate you with challenges. Yeah, and every back when I was in my twenties, I used to think every once in a while maybe I'll go back. You know, you go maybe compete, maybe win a little money. And then I would see a promo for one of those things, and it was like six dudes, obviously on steroids, like in bandanas, punching each other. Just sucker punching each other on the beach. And I was like, hell no. I barely got through the four months in Chicago. As you know, Jim, I had one cool moment on that whole show. And it had to do with the Philadelphia Phillies manager right now and former Chicago Cup. I don't recall. I don't recall there being any cool moments at all. What do you mean? This isn't like one of those, I'm drunk, I'm handing you the keys things, okay? Because that means I'm drunk and I'm handing you the keys. And that's that out to Ryan Sandberg. All right, see, that last sentence that you just said for a second. Is that after Ryan Sandberg? It's not Ryan, it's Ryan. 
That was a great moment. Why would she, why would she be mad that I thought she was drunk? I mean, she sounded perfect. I, I was going to say, wow, she can't even speak. Yeah, you know what? I think she'd been hitting the Goldschlager that night. That was the the Goldschlager era for sure. But so I nailed Sandberg, and that was one cool moment in four months. I will not be going back. All right. So who is going back? Are I, you still are you still friends with any of those cast members? A couple of them, yeah. Friends is her? a relative. No, her. And I haven't spoken to since we left like 13 years ago. Right. I, I, don't, I don't know what happened to her. Hopefully she dried out and sobered up. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I, I certainly didn't for a few years, but she had it a little bit worse than me at the time. I haven't spoken to her. I'm friends with a couple of them. But, it, you know, I was I was going through my own Goldschlager phase. I was about 22 years old. It was a very stressful time, and I would not go back. Bro, ever. to be fair, when I hired you like six years ago, you were still going through the Goldschlager phase. You're right. Let, let us not forget, you were the guy who could actually come home at the time your morning alarm clock went off. That was pretty strong. Several times. And now I'm lucky if I can stay up until like 8.30 p.m. on a Friday night. I'm passing out on the couch, and I wake up at 2 a.m., and my wife's gone upstairs, and the lights are off. Times have changed, man. Dude, real quick, did you hit the Orange County Fair? Yeah, yeah, I hit it on, I hit it on a Saturday. Yeah. There you go. It's incredible. It's a great, great time. I mean, it's we've talked about this before. It's it's such a spectacle to see the people there and the food there. And it's like you don't get in unless you hit like a certain minimum weight. There's such huge people there and unbelievable <laughs> concessions. So is that why you go to feel better about you? Yeah, dude, I, I'm swell. I'm completely shredded compared to those people. And I always like I see like the cows and the pigs, and they got to be thinking real, like, real cows and pigs. Yeah, or, or no, people real that you ones. think are like fat like animals. cows and pigs. And they okay. got to be like, we're in the pen, and you people get to walk out there eating deep fried turkey legs. It should be reversed, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, like they, we should be able to come out and watch you people. The cows should walk around and laugh at the fat people in the pen. Yeah. So you know I've been a little bit down about my weight. The best tonic for that is going to the OC Fair because I felt like I was in crazy shape. All right, so enjoy your return to the real world in Chicago. I'll do that. I'll uh, see you there in the house, too. I'll be there. Seven strangers. All right, KB. It's not you. Ryan. It's Ryan. Kyle Bryant. 1-800-636-8686. All right, then. I do want to talk about the code in baseball. I want to talk about Fernando Rodney. I mean, look, you know this guy got on the wrong side of the Angels if Mike Trout and Albert Pujols both were bumping gums. It was great. I loved it. It was good to see. We will talk Bills football when we come back. Head coach Doug Marone joins me next. Also, my thoughts on Andre Karolinko laying out Jason Kidd. Of course, he did it to a Russian tabloid. It's not like he told the Post or the Daily News. Like that wasn't going to get back. Ned Coletti coming up next hour. Buck Showalter in hour number three. And you are listening to CBS Sports Radio. Camping World is your number one source for everything you'll ever need for the RV lifestyle. Stop in today or visit CampingWorld.com. Camping World is sponsoring this particular segment. Welcome back. Not only are NFL camps opening up, but more and more college football news trickling in. You might have seen Jameis Winston, ACC Media Day, showing up larger in life. Well, he certainly is not shrinking any under the spotlight, is he? Owned it, dominated it, was feeling it, loved it. I mean, literally started the session off by reminding the media that the ACC won the national championship and not the SEC and wanted them to acknowledge it. And said that he's learned his lessons, he's ready to lead from the front. And so we'll hit that too. Right now, though, as promised, I'm joined by the head coach for the Buffalo Bills, Bills coming off a 6-10 and ten season. They opened up their training camp yesterday. They opened up their season at Chicago on September 7th. Doug Marone is our guest. Doug, it's great to have you on. How are you? I'm doing great, Jim. Thanks for having me on. Good to visit with you. I know you're busy today. You are the first NFL team to open up training camp. I know you've been working all offseason, but how does it feel to officially have that camp open up and have football back? Well, I'll tell you what, I'm fired up. Uh, I was fired up when I learned that we were going to play in a Hall of Fame game. Uh, you know, we have a young team, so, you know, the extra practices for us is uh, much needed. All right, in terms of the team itself, Aaron Williams said, and I quote, Doug, we're going to be a winning team. We're going to come out here with a new attitude and be aggressive and bring this city more wins, end of quote. Have you noticed a different attitude in the players this offseason? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, you know, last year was our first year together. I think, uh, you know, obviously the losing left a, a very bad taste in our mouth. Uh, I think everyone understands each other now better than they did a year before. Um, the expectations for us are high, and we have to make sure that performance matches our expectations. All right, so from a coaching standpoint, how different is year number two as opposed to year number one for you personally? Well, you, you know the play is better. You know you know how to you know, you know how to motivate them. They know what you want. I mean, you come in there and, and, and you just get a better sense of trust and a better feel. And um, I think that's been obviously important. It's carried over. We have a lot of of the same players in the room, 
uh, that we had last year. Uh, the systems are in place. They know exactly what we want. And you see, especially on offense with the quarterback, uh, a much more confident um, offensive unit. Doug, from the quarterback standpoint, how different is C.J. Manuel this year as compared to last year? And what do you like best about what you see from him right now? Truly night and day, and 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 he's he's quite different, and and he's different because he's worked hard at it. He really has. Um, uh, now instead of saying, "Hey, this is what we're going to do," this is the offense. Now we're telling them, "Hey, the whys and and why we do things, and what you know, if someone shuts this down, this is what we want to go to." Um, just his demeanor alone. Uh, we've been on the field once so far, you know, for a practice, and we've had walkthroughs. Is is quite different, quite better uh, than it was a year before, to a point where. You know, we're very excited to see the progression. You know, one of the local papers had an article with the headline which read, Playoff Hopes Ride on E.J. Manuel's Shoulders. I mean, obviously he's going to have to play well for you to reach the playoffs and get where you want to go, but it just seems to me the way it is with young quarterbacks, you throw these guys in and you ask so much of them at an early age. I mean, does it all ride on him? Will you go only as far as he takes you? Is that fair? Well, you know, you're absolutely right about, you know, the, the, the pressure uh, that people put on these quarterbacks and, and even in comparison when they're comparing them to, uh, you know, the, 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 the last great quarterback for Buffalo and, and, you know, people will mention Jim for that, but, you know, the great quarterbacks in this league, which, you know, there, there are a couple. So, you know, it, it's I try to tell them to go out there and play, have fun, uh, but don't make no mistake about it. You know, that, that position has to play well in order to win. Doug Marone joins us. I'm glad you mentioned Jim Kelly. I know he came and he spoke to the team during minicamp. What did he tell the players, and what kind of an impact did that message have on the team? I'll tell you, you know, you know, Jim obviously is is uh, part of our family, but you know, he's part of the, the present team. I mean, he's he's the greatest representative we have of, of this region, um, and and he sent a great message. You know, football is a game. You know, we play it, and it's a job, or how we want people want to define it, but. You know, what we can do for the people around us in the region and, you know, the, the, the fans supported Jim when he was a player. They support him even more now, you know, in his battle against cancer. And I think he was trying to explain to us the relationship that you can have as a professional football player. Uh, with a region and the type of impact you have, and, and no one's had more impact than Jim Kelly. Bill's head coach, Doug Marone, joining us. Doug, defensive tackle Marcel Darius failed that conditioning test on Sunday. I'm sure you'll tell me that it's your job to stand behind him and support him, but on on some level, was that disappointing to you that he did not come in ready? Oh, Jim, make, make no mistake. He wasn't the only one, but it's, it's, it's disappointing. It, it really is. And, um, you know, you know, we have a period of time where we have to, you know, uh, speed it up and, and get him ready and get him back on the field. He's a, an outstanding football player. Um, we're at a position now where his sole focus uh, should be uh, just on football, uh, getting himself ready to play, and he can make a great impact uh, for our team. You know, given the offseason that he had and the fact that he did not pass that test, even if he was not the only one, I mean, is his sole focus on football right now? Are you convinced of that? I, I, I believe so. I do. I really do. I think, you know, it's a matter of time. You know, people have asked me, hey, do you believe this? Do you believe that? Obviously, if I'm still in this corner, yes, I still believe it. So, um, you know, we, but it's still, it's, it's, it's a game where you have to, you know, go out there and produce and you have to show that, that you are focused. And it, it's a daily thing and you have to do it on a daily basis. No different than we tell our players we have to compete and we have to win the day. Doug Marone joining us. Doug Kiko Alonso was a stud last year. He played every single snap as a rookie, but he's expected to miss the entire season with a knee injury. How big of a loss is that, and how do you go about filling that void? Sure, it's a loss. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, uh, you know, no problem, go forward, and everything is fine. And, and it does hurt, and, and there's no doubt about it. But, you know, no one feels sorry for you in this league. Um, I feel bad because of the amount of work that Kiko puts in, you know, that he won't be able to participate this year. But, again, it leaves opportunity open. Um, you know, Nigel Bradham, you know, has been up and down, and, and he's really been solid for us uh, since OTAs. You know, he'll have a shot at that position. Preston Brown's another one. Randall Johnson, who we drafted, you know, the two rookies will have a chance. And, you know, we, we picked up some acquisitions here late that, that might have a chance to compete. So we're just getting started, and that position will be open, and we have some time to figure it out. Uh, offensively, talk about rookies. Sammy Watkins comes in, and he said something interesting. He said, quote, with our offense, we've got a lot of explosive guys. So for me, it's just about coming in right away and trying to make plays. Don't try and be Superman, but play my role, and everything will work out. It's actually a very mature statement from a rookie, but when you look at him, does he have some Superman qualities? Uh, I don't. 
I, I would. I mean, you, you, he's a Superman, but you know he does have explosive qualities. I, I like to say that. You know, yesterday he took a ball, you know, real quick, stopped on the dime, was able to get vertically up the field. I yeah, think, kind of, you know, people kind of stepped back and said, "Whoa!" And I think you hit it on the, on the nail on the head when you said about maturity. He's 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 mature beyond his years. You know, for a rookie coming in, um, he understands his role. He works extremely hard. He knows how to go about his business. He has a great amount of respect from the veteran players already, and I think that, you know, he goes out there and it's business for him, and, and, and so far, um, he's, he's, he's looked the part. Hey, Doug, before I let you go, team owner Ralph Wilson passed away in March. He was a titan of the game. I know you spent some time with him. What types of memories do you have of that time that you spent with him? Loyalty. Really, loyalty. I mean, when, when I looked at, you know, you look around this organization and you, and you look at uh, you know him being one of the, the founding fathers, really, you know, of this league and, and how much the game meant to him and how much it was important for the fans and everything. Um, I loved it, you know, and, and he expected a lot. He expected a lot of, of me. He expected a lot of the players. You know, I spoke to him quite a bit, and I, and I have a great amount of respect for the man. Um, his family was, was great to me. He's uh, an unbelievable, he's a Hall of Famer, great part of the game. And, you know, I think when we look back in the NFL, and this is just me, I think, you know, we're, we're going to miss people like, like Mr. Wilson and Lamar Hunt and, and, and all the great leaders that we had in the beginning. Sure, Titans. One final thought. One of the potential buyers in a group might include John Bon Jovi. Have you spent any time with him? And what kind of an NFL owner do you think Bon Jovi would make? Oh, I'm sure whoever becomes the owner of the team will, will, will be fine. You know, I really haven't put much thought to it. I addressed it to the team uh, once, and I told them, hey, let's make sure we can control what we can control and, and let us focus on football and winning. And, you know, Russ Brandon, our team president, will control on, you know, how the ownership goes. In other words, you're living on a prayer with that one, Rome. Nice try. <laughs> nice try with that, Rome. You wanted to get into songwriting. <laughs> Did you copyright that? That's it. Doug Rome, Billis head coach. Doug, appreciate the visit. Thanks so much. Great. Good luck. Thank you, Jim. Pre- you got it. Thank you. God, I love it when they get the jokes. Good job, coach. Good job. Doug Marone, Buffalo Bills head coach, joining us. All right, then. 1-800-636-8686. I'm always eager to hear from the Bills Mafia. It's time of year. Everybody is optimistic. Everybody's going to make the playoffs. Everybody's going to have their run. Is this the year? Bills fan, is this the year? Can you get this thing going? You do not have Kiko Alonso. Marcel Darius off to a bad start, but... Doug Marone said, look, I would not be supporting this guy if I didn't think he had it in him. Sammy Watkins is in. You know they're going to run the hell out of the football. That's a given. And he said, E.J. Manuel, the difference between last year and this year is night and day. All right, we'll break. Nick Letty coming up next hour. Buck Showalter in hour number three. The baseball code is something I want to get into as well. Andre Karolenko smashing Jason Kidd. It would be great if maybe it came from somebody other than Andre Karolenko. Rex Ryan and Rob Ryan. It's a good day when I've got thoughts on both those guys in the same show, and I do. Stay tuned. This is CBS Sports Radio. It's not a very good tweet, but it's a pretty good handle. Twitter handle, Gene Rayburn's Mike at Jim Rome. When Sergio was surging, Rory wasn't just gripping clubs. He was gripping his blank. It's a good Twitter handle. Not a great tweet. I mean, where are you going with that, Gene? That was such a great show. That was so far ahead of its time. There's so many things about that show that are awesome. Game shows back in the day were just tremendous. I mean, you don't see them anymore. I mean, never mind the game show network. I'm just talking about game shows like in prime time, game shows on legitimate networks. That was a great show. How inappropriate was that show? Find that sometime and watch it. Watch him rub up against some of those A-list actresses. This is some of the things he would say. You try that right now, and you are getting fired in a second flat. I also like how they had to change the rules of that show because all the female contestants wanted to match Richard Dawson in the bonus round. Hey, man, this doesn't work anymore. They all pick him. They all pick him. The other five could just walk off the set when it comes time for the bonus round. Just put a wheel up there, man. Make them spin for it. And then you get stuck going with, like, oh, great, Joyce Boulafont. I want Richard Dawson. Fanny Flag, oh, awesome. Why do I have to match Fanny Flag? Nice job. Gene Rayburn's mic. It was kind of a funky microphone, wasn't it? I think it was, like, five feet long. 
Uh, anyway, what's popping, Twitter? Anybody else? Colby Lewis. Colby Lewis taking the code to a whole new level in Major League Baseball. I don't profess to understand the code because you couldn't unless you play at that level, and I didn't, but this is absurd. I don't think you need to play at that level to know that it's okay to lay a bunt down against a shift with two outs in a two-run game. I mean, this guy thought that was a reason to go to war. I need to lay that out for you. Also, I mentioned this last week, and I see a couple of you still want to talk about it. You know how the Niners have this beautiful new stadium being built in Santa Clara? I mean, state-of-the-art stadium. And you know how the Raiders have an extremely crappy stadium and need a new one where they might come back to L.A.? What do you do? What do you do? Hey, other teams share facilities. Why don't we just have the Niners share with the Raiders? I'm sure Niner fans are very happy about that. Are you guys cool if we crash with you for, I don't know, a couple of seasons or a decade or forever? Our fans are chill. You won't even know they're there. Hey, believe me, they will respect it. They're used to playing football on a baseball diamond. They'll love it. Hour number two, when we come back, we'll talk about the code, and I'll open it up to you. That first segment's a fat segment, a long segment. It is wide open. 1-800-636-8686. Rome on CBS Sports Network is back today, too. So we're double dipping. This is CBS Sports Radio. Broadcasting from the O'Reilly Auto Parts studio, I am Jim Rome. O'Reilly Auto Parts, better parts, better prices every day. Welcome back. Coming up in about 15 minutes, Dodgers GM Ned Coletti. Hey, Rome, way to drop living on a prayer on Doug Marone. But when asked about Bon Jovi, I think what Doug meant to say to Bills fans was, it's all the same, only the names will change. Every day it seems we're wasting away. Another place where the faces are so cold, I drive all night just to get back home. Matt in Poland Springs, Maine. And what kind of an NFL owner do you think Bon Jovi would make? Oh, I'm sure whoever becomes the owner of the team will, will, will be fine. You know, I really haven't put much thought to it. In other words, you're living on a prayer with that one, Rome. Nice try. <laughs> nice try with I didn't that, realize Rome. you wanted to get into the songwriting. <laughs> It's got Wars Marone breaking out into Bon Jovi songs for every pregame speech. Uh, Matt, speech. Speech is spelled with two E's, not E-A-C-H. Mixing that spell check, speech. And the question is, who is going to buy that team? How much will it go for, and is it going to stay in Buffalo? Well, it's going to stay in Buffalo at least for the length of the lease, unless they buy the way out of the lease, and that's going to cost them upwards of 20 plus million bucks so that probably won't happen so for the foreseeable future they will stay in buffalo they've got a lease bon jovi would be great jerry jones was going on and on about how bon jovi would be an unbelievable nfl owner great nfl partner you've probably seen the number but there's speculation that the bills could go for more than one billion dollars with a b in front of it anybody from the bills mafia want to talk about what they heard Right there, the first ones to open up camp. We got their head coach, and off we go. I want to talk some baseball. I want to start the second half of the baseball season with us finally hitting rock bottom for the baseball code. Now, I've got to admit, way back in the day, back in the day when guys would talk about the code, I kind of bought into it. I kind of bought into, you know, they just have their own vigilante form of justice. This is just what these guys do. It's different. It's not the NFL where you can get in somebody's face. It's not in the NBA where you can get in somebody's face. They don't do it in the NHL because guys drop gloves. But I was just thought that's just baseball being baseball. That's what they do. But as time's gone on, I've started to kind of move and change with the time. Baseball has not. The code seemingly is not changing. Which brings in Colby Lewis. The Rangers pitcher had himself a little fit over the weekend when Toronto Blue Jay, Colby Rasmus, laid down a bunt to beat the shift with two outs. All right, so let me set the stage for you quickly. Fifth inning, two-run game, two outs. They put the shift on on this guy, and he lays down a bunt to beat the shift, and it did, and then Colby Lewis freaked out. Colby Rasmus trying to play his little boy, and he does so successfully. That's the second bunt 
on the uh, third baseline, and Colby Lewis not real happy with the uh, the Blue Jays with that uh, attack, but part of the game. It is part of the game. You don't. Uh, there are some pitchers that really don't like it, but if you look at it, Colby's delivery. Don't like what? Don't like what? I mean, there are all, all sorts of aspects of the code that we'll never understand because we never played the game at that level, but don't like what? So he tried to explain what it was he didn't like. Colby Lewis said, quote, I told Rasmus I didn't appreciate it. You're up by two runs with two outs, and you lay down a bunt. I don't think that's the way the game should be played, end of quote. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know what? This guy just does not get it. It's a scoreless tie. You're leading off the game. It's a 3-2 count in the month of July. Don't lay down a bunt on me. Let me read that one more time quickly. I told Rasmus I didn't appreciate it. You're up by two runs with two outs, and you lay down a bunt. I don't think that's the way the game should be played. You know what? Somebody call the ambulance. Stat. You don't think that's the way the game should be played? What would a Texas Ranger know about how the game should be played? You've got the worst record in the bigs. You're far and away the sport's biggest disappointment this season. What would you know? I mean, I thought you were a team that was supposed to go to the World Series. You have the worst record in baseball. What would you know about the way the game should be played? You guys shifted. He beat the shift. You're bent about that. That's not classless. That's chess. And you lost again. Rasmus was like, oh, well, you know, what can I say? Whatever. Yeah, it's just part of the game. I understand he was upset, but uh, I, I felt like I didn't do anything that was wrong. It, that's just part of it. They, they played in the shift, and I felt like he was going to throw me some off speed, so I took, uh, did what I had to do to try to get on base to help my team. You know, I, I didn't do anything out of... Uh, out of the unwritten rules of baseball. You know, I just played the game, and I felt like that's what I should do to help my team. 100%. I mean, you position your defense a certain way. He put the ball in play the other way, and it worked. Isn't that what it's about? And again, unless you played that game at that level, there's no way to decipher baseball's ridiculous code, and I haven't, but I know this. Bunting with two outs and a two-run lead against the shift is not in violation of a code. I mean, what Lewis is really saying is, cowboy up. Hit it right into our shift and take your out like a man. I mean, what a bag. And Lewis wasn't done either, by the way. He said the fact that Rasmus didn't steal to get into scoring position within the next two pitches just proves that he was only looking out for himself and his batting average. Yeah, Colby, that or maybe the fact that he has two stolen bases all year long. If anybody's looking out for their numbers, it's Lewis and his 637 ERA. That is the lamest form and example of the code I have ever heard and the worst take of the year from the worst team in baseball. Keep code out your mouth, Kolb. That is terrible. I think we can argue about what the code and code is not, but I think we'd all agree that was not a violation of the code. All right, stay tuned. I've got a reaction to that already. When we come back, Ned Coletti joins us. Dodgers GM is next. Clones. Most Americans do not have a will. question is, why is that? You don't want the court dictating what happens to your property and minor children, so why would you procrastinate? Some people would say it's too expensive. Others would say it's too time-consuming. My answer to both, LegalZoom.com. Too expensive? Legalism's prices simply make sense. Too time-consuming, it takes maybe 20 minutes, and LegalZoom will guide you right from start to finish. The service was developed by some of the best legal minds in the country, and they make it painless for you to get the legal help that you need. In fact, helping people get legally protected has been their mission and passion for over 13 years. During National Make-A-Will Month, get special pricing on wills and living trust by entering my special code, Rome, in the referral box at checkout. It is National Make-A-Will Month, so do not wait any longer. Protect your family, protect your future at LegalZoom.com today. LegalZoom was developed by top attorneys to provide self-help services at your specific direction, but they are not a law firm. Legal help is furnished through vetted independent attorneys. Once again, this is National Make-A-Will Month. They get special pricing on wills and living trusts by going to LegalZoom.com and entering my code name, Rome. Currently efforting 
Ned Coletti. Subject of this email is the stupid code. Romy, how obnoxious is the code? Did anybody see the shift that they put on Rasmus? Hell yeah, Rasmus should have bunted down the third baseline. There was no third baseman. If I was hitting against an extreme shift, I'd bunt down the third baseline every freaking time until they played me honest. Lefties are hitting over 400 against you, Colby Lewis. Worry about getting a damn batter out and less about the baseball code. Sign Cody in Denver. We're Trout, Puig, and Harper demolishing this stupid code. War Puig styling every home run he hits because it makes that game watchable. I'm telling you, it's so true. You know why guys don't do that? Because they know they'll get one in their ear if they do. If a guy's not allowed to bunt in a two-run game with two outs in the fifth, no wonder guys don't do anything like that. As promised, I'm joined right now by the general manager of the L.A. Dodgers. He was hired in... November of 05, and the Dodgers are 10 games over 500. They are tied for first in the NL West. Ned Coletti is my guest. Ned, good to have you back. How are you? All right. All right. Good, good. So, Ned, you're coming off a 4-3 to three win in St. Louis where Adrian Gonzalez came through with an RBI single in the ninth. With two outs, you avoid the sweep. How important was it not only to get that win but to get it the way you got it? Well, obviously, when you come out of the break, I'm always I'm always curious to see if we're going to come out with and get some momentum right away. Some teams come out, you know, you can look at today and and look at uh, three game sweeps across the game. You know, it's important to get out and get a win in your first series. And I'm glad we got it last night. Obviously, a good game and and a, you know a, t- a tough game for both teams. But I think it's imperative you get that win early in your second half so you can start building back some momentum, which we had when the break. Actually ensued. Ned Claudio, our guest, Hanley Ramirez. Ned was hit by a couple of pitches yesterday against St. Louis. Of course, the same team that hit him in the postseason last year. Is it just a coincidence, or might there be something more to that? Well, you know what? They're a, they're a very smart organization, a very smart team. And I think that they, um, maybe more than any other team, they use the entire plate, and they have no fear pitching inside. They have no fear running a guy off the plate. And I guess if it gets away, it gets away. To hit one player... And everybody that they hit, because they hit Puig the day before as well, and uh, nobody's getting hit in the legs, nobody's getting hit down below. It's always in the middle of the body or in the Hanley's second case yesterday, or first case yesterday. It was uh, a little bit higher than that. But you know what? They used the whole plate. I know Mike Matheny real well. I have a lot of respect for as a baseball man and as a human being, and I think that that they're aggressive. They're aggressive on the inside part, and they have no fear. If it does run in, does hit a guy, hey, they'll... Uh, you know, they'll move on and try and get the next guy out. But a little interesting that, that Hanley will get hit three times by them in a relatively short period of games. And um, that uh, Puig would get hit yesterday. But, again, it's part of the, the game. And pitching inside is uh, sometimes a lost art. I think uh, when you watch games, you see guys pitch middle of the plate or away a lot. But uh, in St. Louis's case, they use uh, the inside part of the plate to their advantage. And if they got to knock a guy off the plate to – to throw the ball inside and to keep them honest, uh, they have no no hesitation doing it. Ned Cloudy, my guest, you mentioned Puig getting hit. He missed Sunday's game. What is his status right now? Well, we're going to do a uh, another, um, uh, I'm pretty sure today we're going to do another x-ray on his hand to make sure we didn't miss anything yesterday. It was swollen up pretty good Saturday post-game uh, all on the outside of the hand. And uh, it hurt when he when he tried to tried to swing, and it, it wasn't a comfortable spot for him. So we'll see where he's at today. We don't think it's long term, but we may do one more diagnostic to make sure we didn't miss anything through the swelling on Saturday evening, and uh, hope that we can get him back in the lineup as soon as possible. Now you sat him down before the season, and you told Puig that there were going to be adjustments to be made. That it was going to be a different year for him. What types of adjustments were you trying to make him aware of, and how do you think he's handled it this year? Well, I think the, I think there's always an adjustment with pitching. Uh, and pitchers get paid to to really adjust and to keep a hitter off balance. And I told him that you know he was no longer going to be a surprise to anybody. Everybody had seen him play. Everybody saw the great year he had. Everybody you know knows who he is now. And that the thought process is going to his whole approach to thing is going to have to be uh, being prepared, not just to react sometimes. Because I think as a hitter, sometimes you just react 
which is proper, and sometimes you have thought process to get something accomplished. And I said that that's, that's what you're going to have to, you know, you're, you're going to see it. You're going to see adjustment. You're going to see him pound gin. You're going to see him pound gin, work your way. And, you know, we've seen it from time to time. Uh, I think he has gotten better. He's, he's a much calm, he's still, don't get me wrong, Jim, he's still got a lot of passion and there's a lot of exuberance and a lot of speed in his game. But he does, he does slow it down a little bit more this year than he did last year, both offensively, defensively, and on the bases. We're talking to Ned Clayton. Ned Clayton Kershaw did not get the win last night, but he had another strong outing. We're talking about a guy now who signed a seven-year, $215 million contract. Go ahead and set me down. Put me in my place if you need to, but let me ask you this question. Is there any way that he might outperform a contract that big? Is there at any point in time that you might think, you know what, we might have actually gotten a deal, a bargain in that contract? <laughs> or is that just a ridiculous thing to say? Well, there's a long way to go. You know, I can't tell you that uh, that it was an easy thing for us to do because of the size of the contract and the duration. Um, the flip side of that is, you know, you never know what's going to happen, and you know, the injuries can come and you know can come into somebody's life on any on any given pitch, so to speak. But if there's anybody that you would you would trust with the money and trust with the the opportunity to be in one place for a long period of time because of who he is, how he prepares, how he competes. You add that up, and you, you, you add the, the talent, which is extreme to it. You know, it'll, it, it's tough to tell him no when you have other people that have not accomplished quite as much and might even be be older, making uh, you know just a step down from that. But you know, it's a long contract. There's a long way to go. There's six and a half years to, to go on it. But again, he's uh, what he's done, especially the last month or so, has been as, as good as anybody could ever pitch. And you know, we lost him for a month early, and it was. You know, something we really couldn't do anything about once once he had the feeling in the in the back of his uh, his shoulder and that and that muscle, and but it could be a blessing in disguise too if we can stay in the race, stay competitive with the, with it as a group, and we can get to October. He would end up going into October with probably 40 fewer innings than he would had he not missed any time. And after throwing 260 last year, 259 plus. You know, you have to kind of keep that in mind as you go forward, not just for the seven-year contract, certainly, but also for, for this season and for next season. So hopefully uh, we'll stay in it, and hopefully we won't have uh, any any regrets that he missed that time because nothing we could really do about it anyway. But at the end, it may turn out to be a little bit of a blessing for us as far as how many innings he's pitched by the time you get to the end. We're visiting with Ned Clady, Dodgers GM. You know, Ned, if you know the game, and I'm talking about the listeners now, if you know the game and you know about the Dodgers, think about Sandy Koufax and – I mean, that's the standard right there. There's just an aura and a mystique to Sandy. It's not even Sandy Koufax. It's just Sandy. There's so much more baseball left for Clayton Kershaw to be played, but you always hear those comparisons. By the time he's said and done with his career, is he going to be in that same class, or is there always going to be just one Koufax and then everybody else? Well, I think there's, you know, it's never easy just to, I mean, it's not easy for me just to say this guy is different than this guy, this guy's better than this guy, this guy's going to be better than him or not as good as him. I think it's a, a couple different factors to it. Um, one is that, that Sandy's career, uh, Sandy was a little bit older when he started to be as, as dominant as he was. And I, I had a chance to see him pitch when I was a young kid, and he was everything everybody says he is. And But he was a little bit older, a little bit further along in, in his career, so to speak, that, than Clayton is. But Sandy also pitched every fourth day. You're talking about a different rotation, different uh, different physicality, to what Sandy did versus what Clayton did. Obviously, you got a five-man rotation today. When Sandy was was racking up 25, 30 complete games and winning 25 plus games, winning Cy Youngs, throwing all those no hitters, it was a four-man rotation. Strikingly different for a lot of different reasons than it is today. But I think, you know, that we can sit here and talk about Sandy and talk about Clayton and have the conversation that you just asked me about it says a lot about where we're at with Clayton. Ned Clady joining us. Ned, a few more things before you go. Yeah. Let me ask you about Matt Kemp. He yeah. says, quote, I want to play every day. If it's with the Dodgers or if it's with somebody else, you've heard that. What's your reaction to it? Well, I wouldn't want everybody to want to play every day. So I'm not I'm not taken by that anyway. It's a, um, you know, we've had this so-called four all-star outfielder you know, debate going on here for a long time now. And uh, I don't know how many games, 200 and some games we've had this kind of lingering over us. We probably played 40, 45 games when we had all four of them healthy. So when you have, let's say, 220 games to throw a number out and, and less than 25% of them you've had the full complement, you got to be careful with it. 
and you can't just trade to trade and move to move. You got to be careful with it. My number one objective is winning games. And, you know, sure, I care about players, and I've, I've been around some of these guys for a long time now. But the number one thing I think about every day, and I hope everybody else thinks about connected with the organization, is how do we win today's game? What's the best lineup Donnie can put out there? What gives us the best chance to win today's game? Because after that, everything else is really, really down the road for me. And I think that that's the approach we've got to take. That Matt wants to play every day. Hey, it's better than having somebody say, hey, I really don't feel like playing most of the time. I mean, you know, you don't really see that often, but, you, you, you know, they, that could happen too. So it's okay. It's okay. He's going to play a lot. I think when he said it, he had played 42 out of 44 games. So he was actually, you know, getting what he had uh, said that he wanted. And then is there any party that's saying or would think, oh, we're, like, we're going to let you play every day, Matt. We need you to play in left field, though. You yeah. can play there every day if you want, and if he's not willing to do that, does that make him a selfish player? Well, he has played left. You know, that forty-two out of forty-four, almost all those games were was a start in left field. He may have played a little bit um, in center as a as a as a double switch or switching the outfield around. But you know, at this point in time, we need him to play left field, and that's that's where the need is. That's where we think you know he's coming back from a couple of injuries, a shoulder surgery, an ankle surgery. And we thought that left field would be a better spot for him to, to get back. Does that mean he'll never play center field again? Of course not. But at this point in time, we got him in left field, and we can we could always switch that back, and he can always work himself back into playing center field at some point. Now, last question. You're 10 days out from the trade deadline. There are some huge names out there still available, especially in the way of pitching. David Price, Cole Hamels. How likely is it that you make a move between now and the deadline? Well, first of all, it's it's – and I'm not going to talk about anybody in specific. I'll say, you know, we've, we've always been active in July. We've, we've, except for one year, I've been here. This is my ninth, my ninth year here. And the other eight, I think seven of the eight, we've always been active as, as buyers. One year we were a seller when we traded Raphael for Kyle to St. Louis. So we're always in the market. There's fewer teams that are in the market to trade right now. And you have to have not only the team to trade, second wild card changes dynamics a lot. Uh, you have to have the team that's got the player that that you're seeking, you've got to have the matchup. You've got to have a lot of different things. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about high end players, but I would I would be sure that the high end players are truly available before everybody speculates on who's going where and and how it's all going to go. Because it's it's a, the the rumor mill at this point in the season is far different than the reality. And I think that that's, you know, it's, it's great for the game that everybody talks the game and talks about if this guy's going to get traded or who he's going to go for, or they should do this or they should do that. That is a beautiful part of baseball, maybe better than any other sport that we, that we all watch. But reality and, and rumor are to me far different worlds. And if somebody ever wanted to keep track of rumor versus what actually has happened or at least been conversed on, I think the percentage would be so low of what the reality truly was, I think people would be shocked by it. Got that, listeners? Know that going forward. We've got another week and a half of that. Ned Coletti, Dodgers GM, our guest. Ned, great to have you back. I appreciate your time. Okay, you're welcome, Jim, always. Yeah, you too, Ned. Appreciate it. Always a good conversation. Ned Coletti. <laughs> if somebody would actually keep track of what went down as opposed to what was speculated about what might go down, they'd be shocked by what they see. Probably. In any event, 10 more days of that. I like talking to Ned Colletti. Old school, shoot straight from the hip. In the meantime, the Dodgers are 10 games over. They're tied for first in the NL West. And the fact is, they haven't gotten the best productivity they could get from some of their biggest guns. And they're still right there. And they may make that move. They may still make a move. Angels get their closer. Houston Street comes over in a trade. They are looking awfully good right now. In fact, what a weekend series that was between the Angels and Seattle, which will bring me to the Fernando Rodney rule, which I will set up. It's a brand-new rule. Your thoughts on Ned Coletti. I've got Buck Showalter coming up next hour. Take a short time out. Open phones right now. Hit me. 1-800-636-8686. Big booking day. We had Doug Marone, Buffalo Bills head coach. That's Ned Coletti. Buck Showalter is still to come. If you want to go back and talk some golf, we can. Tiger Woods very clearly is not back. Not if he's finishing 69th and not if he's finishing behind 64-year-old Tom Watson. Rory on top of the world and killing Jägermeister from the Claret Jug. Also, not only is Rome back, our daily TV show, but we've got a tweeted segment. So... You want to take your shot, get your tweet heard and read on television? Tweet at 
Jim Rome. More on CBS Sports Radio in a few moments. You're listening to... Summer temperatures place added stress on your battery, especially one that's about to fail. So you want to get yours tested for free at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Better parts, better prices every day. Let's go back to Ned Coletti for a minute. And the fact that Hanley Ramirez was hit by two pitches yesterday, and they got Yasiel Puig the day before. And you know there's some bad blood here. You got St. Louis, you got Los Angeles. Remember, they're the same team, the Cards, that hit Ramirez last year in the postseason, which prompted this text, or I should say tweet. The Carter tweets, quote, Ned Coletti had some interesting comments about St. Louis pitching inside during his interview with Jim Rome. Hashtag birds. If by interesting you mean expansive, he did. This was a very, very detailed response when I asked him, was it just a coincidence or is there more to it than that, that they hit Ramirez twice yesterday after hitting him in the postseason last year? A very detailed and thoughtful response. I know Mike Matheny real well. I have a lot of respect for as a baseball man and as a human being. And I think that, that they're aggressive. They're aggressive on the inside part. And they have no fear if it does run in, does hit a guy, hey, they'll uh, you know, they'll move on and try and get the next guy out. But a little interesting that, that Hanley will get hit three times by them in a relatively short period of games that uh, Puig would get hit yesterday. But, again, it's part of the, the game. And pitching inside is uh, sometimes a lost art. I think uh, when you watch games, you see guys pitch middle of the plate or away a lot. But uh, in St. Louis's case, they use uh, the inside part of the plate to their advantage. And if they got to knock a guy off the plate to, to throw the ball inside and to keep him honest, uh, they have no, no hesitation doing it. That was like half the response. I don't think he was going to come right out and say, it's Bush, they were coming after our guys. But he did say things like, it was interesting. He did say, it's interesting where they hit our guys. You know how it is. If you want to send a message, there's a place and a way to hit a guy. And there are ways when you shouldn't. You want to hit a guy to send a message, you hit him in the back. You hit him in the butt. You don't hit him in the wrist. You don't hit him in the elbow. You don't hit him in the knee. You hit a guy where you're not going to hurt him, just aggravate him, just to send a message. And I think what he was suggesting was that's not how they were doing it. Ed in Santa Paula, Ed Jim Rome. I am not a Dodger fan, but Ned Coletti is a great GM. And then this guy, Romy. I remember a time back when we were playing Dallas in 87. We were blitzing hard off the right side, and that D-bag, Danny White, Audible into a toss left. That was so Bush. Not the way the game should be played. Signed Ronnie Lott. That to me is not a great email, but his signature is. Jeff in the Windy City, 300-pound bencher. I like that. Get your bench in there. You should sign every email now, all of you, with how much you can bench. Like Jeff. Jeff in the Windy City, 300-pound bencher. Hey, Jeff, talk to me. What was it like the first time you put 300 up? How good did that feel? Did you lock it out? Was it a good rep? Did you slam it back on the rack? Did you have a spot? Did you chalk up beforehand? And exactly what did it feel like? Did you hit protein afterwards? What is your record? How many times can you put 300 up? Is it just that one max, that one? Or is it a case of, hey, Rome, come on now. You know this, all it takes is one. All it takes is one, and I'm in the club, and I'm in that club. Otherwise, I would not sign my emails. Jeff in the Windy City, 300-pound bencher. I'm in the club. A club, Rome, that you will never be in, that you can only aspire to. Separating the men from the boys, the 300 club. And now the wars. War this being the exact time of BS that's killing baseball. War every living baseball fan passing away from old age in the next five years. War Lyle doing the real world again just so I can pick up the skanks he turns away. There's something even better. You want to do some good Lyle sporting? 
go on YouTube and find out. He showed me this. I didn't really see too much of this before it. On Friday, Lyle hit me with something like, see, I, okay, let me backtrack. I had to do something for the public schools where I live. So we laid down some videotape. I actually spent my entire Saturday, quote, acting. And he knew I had to do it. So before I went out, he said to me, if you're looking for some inspiration, click this. It was Lyle in his soap going one-on-one -on -one with some other dude that kind of looked like Lyle. One-on-one <laughs> -on, -one on a basketball court. First one to 11. I don't know what it was. But these guys were uh, bumping into each other, throwing the ball at each other, talking mad junk. Lyle, very clearly you did your push-ups before you went on the set. It's funny, man. It's awesome. I said, dude, this stuff's so good. How about the real world? He said, thankfully, you cannot find very much of that online. But there's plenty of the other. In fact, how we got to link them to that? Put it up on Facebook. Let's go comments. Lyle going one-on-one -on -one with some other bag. First one to 11 wins. And they're arguing about something, probably some chick. Jeff in the Windy City, 300-pound bencher. Go to Facebook.com slash Jim Rome. Keep hitting that thing. Refresh, refresh, refresh. There's going to be something on it, something awesome on it soon enough that you're going to want to see. Facebook.com slash Jim Rome. Facebook.com slash Jim Rome. Let's talk about the Angels for a minute. We hit the Dodgers. Let me go back to the Angels. As long as we're talking code, let me add another bylaw to the book. Write this down, seam heads. If the code's not going away, let me add to it. If you're a closer, wait until the game is over before you reach for the quiver. Going forward, this is going to be known as the Fernando Rodney rule. Now, I know this dude grinds a lot of gears. Very polarizing, aggravates a lot of people with his signature celebration, that insane brim tilt. I mean, you ask the haters, F-Rod might as well be A-Rod. And there was some past history here in Anaheim, Urgh, Los Angeles. He played for the Angels. It did not go well. The fans remembered it. He felt they were booing him, so he had a little something for him. You know, that'd be fine, Fernando, except you got a little something for everybody. But I don't care. I like it. I really like it. In a sport of statues, this guy's one of the only showmen. And now that he leads the American League in saves, you know the guy's going to go out there and run it. I get a kick out of the guy. The Angels don't. But in this case, I can't say that I blame them. Because yesterday, he tried to style a save after the eighth inning. He got out of a nasty jam. He whipped out the air bow. And he hit the Angels dugout with an arrow. Off speed, out towards center field. Hit pretty well. Andy Chavez, however, near the track will make the catch. And the Angels are done here in the eighth. This is after the last out of the eighth inning. And usually he points it out towards center field, but this time he pointed right towards the Angels dugout. I wonder if he uh, just vapor walked and thought that that was the ninth inning, that that was it. Oh, no, I think he knew it was the eighth inning. No, I think he knew it was the eighth inning. I think, like I said, he had a little something for the Angels, for their fans. And the two key things there, it was not towards the outfield. It was directed. That arrow was directed right at the dugout, and it was not after the game. It was after the eighth. So what happens? The Angels promptly hit him in the face in the ninth. Trout walk. Pujols goes inside out, double, tie the game. Hamilton hit, another hit, blown save, ball game. Thanks for coming. And you know Nando is under dude's skin if Trouty and Big Al are jumping in and both mocking him. Trout takes off. The pitch is caught on. That's down the right field line. That will go for extras. Trout went into a slide at second. He's headed to third. He's being waved in. Here comes a throw by Romero. We are tied up at five. The ball gets away. Pools remains at second. And while Albert got to second base, Albert took the arrow out and shot it at the Angels' dugout. Wait, what? Pujols. Did you even know the guy had a personality? And Trout did the same thing. And Trout's the ultimate straight arrow, yet he was still shooting his across the infield. Hey, Hawkeye, you can't open your archery range after the eighth 
especially if you've got to go back out there and retire the same freaks in the ninth. This is what I now call the Fernando Rodney rule. The Rodney rule for all closers, if you still have to face some of the era's best hitters, keep your hand out the quiver. (laughs) Bad look. Mike Sosha, who normally does not have very much to say, had a whole lot to say about this. Our guys noticed it. That's, that's all I'm saying. All right, so Mike Sosha had nothing to say. So Mike Sosha has always had nothing to say. Now, our guys noticed it, though. Might as well be like a diatribe from Mike Sosha. I also love this whole notion of, hey, I woke us up. What, they weren't going to get to this guy otherwise? He had to break out that arrow to wake them up? No, he did. Great series this weekend. couple of extra inning games, and then the walk-off with the arrow against Seattle. Angels look good. And Fernando, that thing came back and hit you right between the eyes. And go ahead and do it. Let's get without baseball. If you don't have that sort of thing in baseball, we talked about this on Jim Rowe on Showtime in July. There's like no stars. Guys don't want to be stars anymore. Guys don't want to be that guy. And part of the reason is this stupid code which still governs the game. I like guys like Fernando Rodney, and I like that the Angels returned it. Baseball needs more of that. Stay tuned. Buck Showalter coming up next hour. In fact, I know it's that time of year. We are loading up on baseball. Get some good names, though. Matt Holiday tomorrow. Tyson Ross. Padres all-star pitcher tomorrow. Buck Showalter next hour. You're listening to CBS Sports Radio. Do not go anywhere still to come. Andre Karolenko taking a two-by-four to Jason Kidd, saying that Kidd did not like the pressure of New York City. All right, Andre, you say so. I'm not saying the kid hound that perfectly. I'm saying that nobody really cares what you think, Andre. But I'll get into that when we come back. you Go to Facebook.com slash Jim Rome. Check out the video we have posted. Kyle Brandt in his acting days when he was a soap opera star. Some of these comments are incredible. Dustin, actor, quote, worst start to worst porno ever. Ryan Franks, quote, Kyle Brandt, acting good enough for a full-time radio career. Steve Lyons, quote, Shouldn't one be shirts and the other skins? Stucknut. Where's Iceman and Goose? Keep it up. Facebook.com slash Jim Rome. Check it out. Looking ahead to hour number three, we've got Buck Showalter. And I want to go back and talk some more about the Open Championship. Rory McIlroy gets it done. That's the third leg of a Grand Slam, and he gets it by the age of 25. I don't know if you know this or not. Have you heard the story? His old man and some of his boys put down a bet about a decade back that he would win the Open Championship before he turned 26. He did. It paid out over 300 grand to them. Third hour coming up. You're in the jungle. I am Jim Rome, and this is CBS Sports Radio. Broadcasting from the O'Reilly Auto Parts studio, I am Jim Rome. O'Reilly Auto Parts, better parts, better prices every day. Roy McElroy. Wins the Open Championship, and in so doing, he wins his third major and is one leg away from a career Grand Slam, and he's only 25. And it's been a tough year and a half for him, but it looks like now he's finally got it figured out. And if he keeps it together on and off the course the way I think that he can and should, I mean, we're talking about a career Grand Slam by his mid-20s. And he'll be one of the best ever to pick up the bats. And when I mean good, I mean like Tiger Woods good. I mean like Jack Nicklaus good. I mean, that kind of upside, that talented. If his mind is right, if he's right on and off the track, he will be in that category, I think. I mean, I'm not saying the guy's going to sit here, or I'm not going to sit here and say he'll win 14 like Tiger Woods has, but he's got three at 25, three different ones at 25. And there's no doubt in my mind that he'll get that green jacket too. Woods? Well, Woods started with a first-round 69, and a lot of you Tiger Woods honks were like, see, see, he is back. He is back. He's got this. He's got this. Started with a first round 69 and finished in 69th place. He is not back. It's not reasonable to think that he is. If anything, I'd say maybe he's ahead of schedule. I didn't expect him to play this soon, but this is going to be a long process. He's got a lot of work to do. 
23 strokes off the lead and five shots behind 64-year-old Tom Watson leads me to believe that he is not back, nor close to it. We hit the baseball code a couple of different ways. Dear Jim, I think it's a good thing that Kobe Lewis only plays baseball. I can imagine his other claims. For instance, if he played basketball, he would say, we double teamed him down low, and he had the nerve to pass it to the open guy instead of forcing up a shot. (laughs) (laughs) Regards, Todd in Southern Oregon. Wore Pujols and Trout having archery practice during the game. Again, I've heard some crazy aspects to the code. Some things that make no sense whatsoever. But that's the worst interpretation of the code I've ever heard in my life. Kobe Lewis getting all bent out of shape because Toronto Blue Jay, Kobe Rasmus, had the audacity to lay down a bunt and beat their shift. How lame would the guy have looked if he hit right into the shift? But not according to Lewis. Lewis is like, come on, there's a right way to play the game and a wrong way to play the game, and you're playing it the wrong way, Rasmus. Quote, I told Rasmus I didn't appreciate it. You're up by two runs with two outs, and you lay down a bunt. I don't think that's the way the game should be played. I mean, he was acting like he laid a bunt down during a perfect game. We're two outs in the ninth inning. And can I tell you, when that happens, there's still a conversation on both sides of that. Because I've seen that happen before, where I try and argue, you know what, you don't need to be doing that. Get a base hit. Get a base hit the way you should get a base hit. But a lot of you would still argue, nope, nope, nope. His job is to get on any way he can. His job is to break up that perfect game. And if he beat out a bunt, so be it. I'd listen to that argument. But I guarantee there are a lot of guys in this guy's own clubhouse who was like, come on, man, really? This is not a violation of the code. We put the shift on. He beat the shift. He pushed a bunt the other way. That's terrible. At that point, I feel like blowing up the entire code. If that's what the code is, and if that's what the code represents... Time to start over. Tear that thing down. Tear it down. Start over. Rome. And this guy is out of his mind. I don't know if you know this or not, Kyle. Matt in Poland Springs gets a lot of emails read. It's funny. Kyle never knows that. He just brings me ones that look good to him. I've seen this guy a couple times already today. Rome. The Raiders are like that little pest brother who lived at home with his mother until he was 25 who after countless run-ins with the law could never land on his own feet. Now, after getting caught for stealing a kid's bicycle, mom and dad are kicking him out of the house, and immediately he calls Big Brother to stay on his couch, even though Big Brother has his life in order with a wife and kids. The little brother never leaves on his own. Matt in Poland Springs, Maine. Yeah, that's we're talking about the Raiders glomming on and sharing the Niners' brand new facility. Now, that's like the little brother whose brother does all the right things, gets a good job, stays out of trouble, and then gets himself like a new Mercedes Benz. And the little brother is a total screw off who can't even afford a car. He's like, yo, bro, you mind if I share that car with you? Hey, can I have that spare key so like we can both use this car? I'll fill it up with gas once in a while. If anything, they should play at AT AT&T Park. That's where the Raiders should go, AT&T Park. There's a baseball diamond to play on. They're used to that. And believe me, that's an upgrade for them. That's a nice park. That's a beautiful facility. By the water, nice infield, good infield compared to their infield. Yeah, I should probably like that. Yeah, I'm sure the Niners aren't really keen on that. Let's talk Jets football for a minute. I would like to welcome back the one, the only, Rex Ryan. It's been a while, big fella. It's been so long, you're no longer even big fella. But while Rex has stopped popping buttons on his shirt, he is back to popping off with his mouth. Quote, somebody asked me if we focus on New England. Bull bleep. I have to be honest, I don't worry about them. They need to worry about us, end quote. One of those famous, famous athlete proverbs. Oh, no, I don't worry about them. They can worry about us. We don't worry about them. They got to deal with us. Yeah, that's awesome. That really is awesome. 
except it's not so much a quote as it is a wormhole back to 2009. Here we are back in 2009. I got to be honest now. I don't worry about them. They need to worry about us. A wormhole back to 09. The hangover is cleaning up in theaters. I tend to think of myself as a one-man wolf pack. 09. The Black Eyed Peas showing up pretty much everywhere. There was no wedding, bar mitzvah, party, reunion, anything, anywhere without that song. 09. What a great year. And the Big Fat Jets coach, four letter bombing everything in sight. Let's go to eat a goddamn snack. That's when the Jets mattered. When they were busting people up and ripping off playoff wins. Can't wait. Came before the butt fumble and the Tebow debacle. Back when they were face punchers instead of punch lines. That's how Rex talked back then. That's what he was about. When he had the team to back up all the junk that he was running. Nothing but no he didn't moments. Now it's just... No, he shouldn't. Because he should focus on the Pats because they win that division every single year. What do you mean you don't focus on the Pats? They're the team to beat. They win it every single year. And I'd say right now the hoodie is about as worried about Geno Smith's Jets as he is about his own wardrobe. I mean, hell, is Geno Smith even going to win that job? I'm not even convinced he will. So when you're running your mouth while going to the AFC title game, it's smack talk. But when you do it coming off an eight-win season and Geno Smith is your quarterback, then it's just background noise. And it's annoying. My man, do the same thing with the Pats that you've done with pastries. Keep them out your mouth. That rings hollow. That's just weak now. Dropping a BS bomb and we don't worry about them. They worry about us. I'm guessing they're not that worried about you, Rex. Yeah, we don't worry about the Patriots. No, nah, they're not even on my radar. I'm more focused on the Bills and the Dolphins. You trust me, they're not thinking about you. Let's go to the phones. We go to Santa Clara. Edward in Santa Clara. It's good to have you, Edward. What's going on? That got the, the stadium initiative passed, uh, and I went to the ribbon cutting for the uh, new stadium. Everything's red and gold. You got the SF logo engraved into the seats. Now, the Raider fans would destroy that stadium. You also got Joe Montana building a hotel there early next year. He's going to have the groundbreaking. There's no way that's going to work. All right, so as, as, as a Niner fan, then, how do you feel about the Raiders coming in and you sharing your beautiful new facility with them? How do you feel about that? Yeah, there's no way it could work. I mean, the Raider fans are going to destroy that place. I mean, we have shootings. We have stabbings at Candlestick in the park lot. There's no, just no way uh, that's going to help. And the uh, Raider fans also, I mean, th- there's a lot of them in L.A., they can go march down to City Hall and demand a new NFL stadium. I mean, L.A. is the second biggest city in the country, and you got Santa Clara population around 100,000. They were able to get it done. L.A. should be able to get it done. All right, Edward, I would agree with you, except that L.A. has been trying to get it done for about 20 years, and it hasn't happened yet. All right, but that's a Niner fan saying, look, don't be coming around here, Raider fan, Raider team and Raider fan. We don't need to see you here in Santa Clara. We've got a beautiful new facility. They've already engraved SF into the seats. Joe Montana's building a hotel right outside the stadium. Not enough room for you, Raider fan. And then he got in the requisite stabbing and beating references, too. Can I tell you something? I would allege that there are beatings in almost any NFL stadium these days. You put on the wrong colors in any stadium... And you might be at risk. That's not just a Raider thing. Now, Raider fan can get pretty unruly at times. But you tell me one fan base that doesn't. Tell me one. You tell me one fan base in the NFL that can't get unruly at times. There's always going to be an element. When you combine booze, gambling, rabid fans, passion, People with crappy lives, some that are not there to have a good time, or their idea of a good time is very different than your idea of a good time. 
somebody looks at you the wrong way, somebody's got the enemy colors on. If there's a stadium with 75,000 people and maybe only 20 or 30 bad seeds or a couple hundred bad seeds, that's all it takes. Anyway, Niner fan, how do you feel about that? Nothing's said, nothing's done, nothing's etched in stone, but it's been brought up. What about this possibility that we share the facility? Jets and Giants do. Works there. This guy's like, no, I don't want to hear that. Just go to L.A. Market number two. You've got Raider fans down there. They've been there before. Just go to L.A. And by the way, they might. They could. They might. All right, stay tuned. We'll come back. Phone lines are wide open. Anybody else want in? Hey, Rome. Damn. That, I'll be kill it. This is a really important message. Hey, Rome. Damn. That one-on-one with Lyle was badass. Signed, throwing down on a seven-foot rim at the local elementary school. Sweet look, Lyle. You guys crack on Lyle all you want. I was into it. I had nothing but respect. I'm like, dude, why would you give that up? I mean, you're extremely talented. You do a great, great job here. You got your own thing going, but I, why would you give that life up? That looks awesome. Dudes get to put on a lot of makeup, play basketball, spit game at one another, play on seven-foot rims. Why would you ever give that up, Lyle? Uh, anyway, Alvy, roll it. Bella Wood. Pre-finished hardwood flooring is so exceptional in quality and durability that it comes with a transferable 100-year warranty. This is now your last chance to get the best Bella Wood deals ever at Lumber Liquidators. I'm talking enormous savings on Bella Wood pre-finished hardwood flooring with the best scratch resistance in its class. If you've got dogs, you've got kids, this is exactly the hardwood floor that you need. Get American Cherry for 54% less than comparable floors at other stores or solid ultra strand bamboo for 38% less. This is not your typical strand bamboo. It's ultra strand. You can even save 24% off the brand new Bellawood Matte Hardwood. It's got this awesome low gloss oil finish look. Do you want a floor that will hold its beauty for decades? Then you want Bellawood. But if you do not get into your local lumber liquidators before July 22nd, then you are done because that is your last chance to save all that cash. And special 12 month financing is available on qualified purchases. To find a store near you, go to lumberliquidators.com. The deal ends on July 22nd. Lumberliquidators.com. He's taking his fair share, too. Hey, Rome, I agree with Kobe Lewis. While we're talking about code, I think home runs should be against the code. How is it fair when teams put players in the field and then some batters have the audacity to hit the ball out of the field? Bud Selig needs to make this his last mandate before leaving baseball. Get the home run out of the game. War Pintar. Sean, Lethbridge, A.B. Good job, Sean. Well played. Stealing bases, too. Stealing bases. There's no need for that. You're just trying to make guys look bad. You're showing guys out, showing guys up. Just play station to station. Do not steal bases. In fact, don't even take leadoffs. Just stand on the bag. Stand at first and wait for a hit. And, and situational hitting, let's get that out of the game, too. Now you're just getting cute. No situational hitting. No advancing the runners. Brooklyn Net, Andre Karolanko. This guy's known for a lot of things, right? His wacky lettuce. His even wackier relationship with his wife. Known more for those things at this point than he is for his game. The big Russian took just four shots per game last year, but landed about 10 on former coach Jason Kidd. Karolenko told a Russian tabloid that Kidd was not up to the challenge of New York, not up to working and dealing with the pressure in New York. Quote, the pressure is huge and Kidd couldn't handle it. Or maybe he didn't want to. End quote. Look at the Siberian Express going in. In, going in on Kid, and he wasn't done. He summed up the Kid era in Brooklyn by saying, "Quote: Basically, he was not able to do much of anything. 
If you look at the big picture, we have to admit that fact, end quote. Hey, listen, I understand where if you're a net, you might be put off. If you're a net, you might think that he bailed. If you're a net, you probably think Jason Kidd could have handled that better, and he probably could have, without question. But when Kirilenko says we have to admit that fact, yeah, just like we have to ask the question, if Andre Kirilenko cracks his coach from the end of the bench, does it make a sound? Again, I know Jason Kidd left the Nets in a tough spot, and I can't condone the way he bounced. And I really don't know if he could handle the pressure or not in New York. I just think it's pretty hilarious that some scrub at the end of the bench is the one calling him out. What's next? Tyshawn Taylor calling him gutless? Marcus Teague smashing kid for being a coward? Karolenko probably should stick to doing what he does best. Ripping his annual pass to cheat on his wife. Rocking the worst lettuce in the NBA and the worst ink on earth. Hey, but you got me to talk about you. Otherwise, there was no way I would have ever, ever. Certainly not for any basketball reason. Piling on Jason Kidd. Oh, Chris and Seaport is in via Twitter. At Jim Rome. Dear frightened 49ers fan. Time to die! Time to die! Signed Raider fan. More beatings, stabbings, and zap signs. Hey, again, if you're the NFL, your biggest concern has got to be the game day experience. Not only might you have to deal with a beating or a stabbing or a zap sign, there are a million other things. Watching that game at home in a climate-controlled environment where you don't have to pay for parking, where there's no waiting for the bathroom, where you don't have to pay $12 for a warm beer, and you can get in front of your 100-inch screen, is always going to be better. Street Dreamer 83 is in, tweeting at Jim Rome. Raider fans wouldn't want to share a stadium with a bunch of arrogant, self-absorbed, front-runner 49er fans. Yeah, I get that. But have you been to that stadium? You might want to share it when you get there. That house is better than your house. It's a brand new house. But do you want to stay in your 2,000 square foot house with the rusted out pipes and the mold? Or would you like to go to a brand new 10,000 square foot edifice that's shiny and brilliant and wired for everything? You don't act like that. Hell no, I'm not sharing that house with them. I'll just stay in this tenement. Come on, man, get real. You know you don't feel that way. I want to congratulate the Columbian Missourian newspaper. They came up with a tweet of the week, and I quote, Saturday marks 45 years since Lance Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon. Where were you? That was the tweet. Saturday marks 45 years since Lance Armstrong... And Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon. Where were you? It's incredible. Not only did Lance Armstrong beat cancer and win the tour like 14 times, he walked on the moon. Where was I? Where was I? Where were you? I know where you weren't. History class. The only way Lance landed on the moon is to be turned back time and filled his syringes with rocket fuel. Lance Armstrong did not walk on the moon. Lance did not go to the moon and bring his bike up there and ride around in a circle, passing people up and jamming the bike pump in the spokes of the Peloton. Lance did not ride his bike on the moon, nor did he walk on the moon. What am I on? I'm on performance against some drugs. What are you on? What am I on? What am I on? I'm on the surface of the moon. What the hell do you think I'm on? What am I on? What am I on? What am I not on? What am I on? What am I not on? What am I on? You name it, I'm on it. What am I on? What am I on? I'm on the surface of the moon. One f- small step for cyclists. One giant leap for the entire peloton. What am I on? Oh, so great. I'll never forget that. When he got off and he dropped his bike on the moon. I was riding over those craters. It's incredible. 
Lance Armstrong, Buzz Bissinger. I'll never forget when those two guys dropped down on the surface of the moon. <laughs> Buzz. Buzz is so awesome. And because this all got reset, that video once again went viral of Buzz knocking out that kook who was hassling him about making up the moon landing. It is so great. At this point, Buzz, at that age, punching a guy in the face who's got at least a half a foot on him, who had a Bible in front of him and said, said, Aldrin, Aldrin, why don't you swear on this Bible that you walked on the moon? I mean, this guy was at least 40 years his junior and had probably a half a foot on him. You're the one who said you walked on the moon when you didn't. Calling the kettle black if you ever thought of saying I misrepresented get myself. away from me. You're a coward and a liar and a thief. Bam. So this guy is just agitating. And he's just, I mean, he's not even egging him on. He's in his face saying you are a coward you are a liar, you're a thief, and he's got a camera, and the camera's rolling on the whole thing because the guy's making some kind of documentary or something. And he's all over him. And Buzz just goes overhand right, punched him right in the face. It was so great. You're the one who said you walked on the moon when you didn't. Calling the kettle black if you ever thought of saying you I misrepresented myself. Get away from me. You're a coward and a liar and a thief. Buzz was so great. I mean, he handled that. He's like, look, enough, enough, man. Get away from me. Enough. And he didn't. So he popped him one, man, right in the kiss. Of... At this point, that moment in and of itself is probably even more significant to our history than Buzz walking on the moon with Lance Armstrong. Seriously. I think a lot of us remember where we were when Buzz and Lance dropped down on the moon. But I think we all remember where we were when Buzz turned the lights out on that guy. That way, Buzz. When we come back, Buck Showalter joins us. Here in the jungle, I'm Jim Rome. Buck Showalter is next. You're listening. Are you still not an O Rewards member yet? Then visit orewards.com and become an O'Reilly O Rewards member today. Start earning five dollars back on every one fifty you spend. O'Reilly Auto Parts. Better parts, better prices every day. We were out to Buck Showalter. You know, Buck is a stickler for details. I'm sure we will run him down momentarily. Baltimore in first in the AL East. They've got their three-game lead. Dan in Louisville is in, tweeting at Jim Rome. When some dork says you didn't land on the moon, add that to the list of reasons to go. It's a pretty amazing thing. I don't know if you've actually seen that video, but this guy is, I mean, he's hassling Buzz. It's one thing to say, hey, look, I want an interview, I want an interview, or it's one thing to challenge the veracity of something. But, I mean, he's right in this guy's face. You're a liar. You're a liar. You're a cheater. You're a thief. And Buzz, I mean, if you watch the video, too, he kind of, like, tried to stay away, turn this way, turn that way. I think the guy had been staking him out for quite some time. And he finally just said, enough's enough, and he punched him in the face. I would imagine, like, if you're Kanye or other celebrities, you probably deal with that every single day. Constantly, somebody's got a camera in your face trying to hook you. And I don't mean like even photogs or paparazzi. I mean, certainly that. But anybody with a camera phone just tries to get you to say something or do something that will go viral. And a thief. And to get them paid. People are looking to get paid. People are looking to get famous. People are looking to get clicks and views. You know, if you can bait a celebrity into punching you in the face and get paid for it, it's a good day, right? Well, if that was that guy's objective, then he had a great day because Buzz punched him in the face. And a thief. And a thief. And a thief. Seriously, it's like maybe he had taken enough. When he called him a thief, at that point he had to go. You can hear the punch land right on thief. And a thief. Actually... The punch landed right before Thief. And a thief. Almost, I, I'd say kettle. tie goes to the runner. I'd call say the, fist to face and Thief, tie goes to the runner. He's safe. Calling the kettle black if I ever thought of saying you I misrepresented get my way from me. You're a coward and a liar and a thief. You call an astronaut a coward and a liar and a thief. 
I mean, in progression, about the three worst things you could say about somebody. You're gutless, and you're dishonest, and you're a thief. You're a coward and a liar and a thief. I'll tell you what, that guy's lucky that Buzz didn't go ground and pound on him. You know, that, that Buzz showed his prowess in the stand-up game. Had that thing gone to the mat, had that thing gone to the street, look the hell out. And a thief. That's what I'm glad for. Good job, Buzz. 1-800-636-8686. That number's toll free. You know, we talked to Doug Marone earlier. And he talked about Marcel Darius, and he did admit, look, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I'm thrilled by this, but he's going to be fine. You know, the problem with Marcel Darius is a few problems. I mean, Buffalo needs a leader on defense. This is a pro bowl caliber player, great talent, but they need a leader. They need somebody to step up because Kiko Alonso wrecked his knee, and probably he's going to be out for the year. So then you think, all right, Darius, Darius can be that guy. But not if he's coming in and not even passing his conditioning test. And it would seem to me that if there's anybody who had to start that season in the right frame of mind and body, it was Marcel Darius. We're talking about a guy who had a really bad offseason, got arrested for ganj, was arrested for street racing a few days after that. So if anything should have been a wake-up call, it should have been him slamming his Jaguar into a tree. Except that was not a wake-up call. Apparently, he hit the snooze button, and he came in out of shape. Which, to me, is pretty inexcusable. I mean, it's not like, and never mind all the trouble he had off the field, it's not like you don't see that test coming. Every level of football, from Pop Warner to Pro, has them essentially every single summer. You know the tests are coming, the conditioning tests. They can't put you out there and make all sorts of demands of you until they know. Conditioning tests. So, you run around the block a couple of times before camp, and you make sure you're ready. I mean, we're not talking about the Ironman here. For pro athletes especially, we're not talking about the Ironman. You run around the block a couple of times, and then you pass it. So, if you're a big-name player, and you're a star, and you fail one of those things... It produces a couple of other things. Number one, the laugh-a-minute local fatties from the wacky local radio shows who then run the morning show out to the park so they can have the fat member of the staff do the test. Like, hey, man, you did better than he did. That's incredible. (laughs) Two things happen. The morning zoo goes out there, and they have their chunkiest member run the same test. And, secondarily, you have the head coach who gets bent. Now, Doug Marone came on the show. He didn't sound bent. He didn't sound extremely angry. He did say, look, I was not happy about it, but it's going to be fine. He'll be right. His priorities are straight. Before I came on the show, he was quoted as saying, Darius has a good heart. We need him to play football for us. He's got a good heart, but he's got gas and lungs right now. That's the problem. Good heart, big gut. Good heart, big gut, lead foot, and a sack of salad. They need this guy to come correct. And if that's not a wake-up call, I don't know what is. Come on, Darius, you're better than that. Hey, we'll take one short time out. Take one last shot at Buck. That's coming up next. Stay tuned. This is CBS Sports Radio. Quicken Loans at 1-800-QUICKEN or go to quickenloans.com and get a free home loan review. 800-QUICKEN, equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS number 3030. We somehow missed on Buck Showalter. We will reschedule that. In the meantime, I've got a few tweets and a huge call. I am the walrus at Jim Rome. Quote, Buzz Aldrin, Bobby Ramos, bottom line. You didn't land on the moon. That has to be a problem for you. Bobby Ramos, bottom line. Mark Big Rig, 59, quote, Buzz Aldrin is going psychotic. He's bleeping, beating people up. We need help. Buzz Aldrin is going psychotic. He's beating people up. And we need help. 
and a thick. Boy, that's got some legs now. That is going to get better. That's one of those sound bites that will only get better every single day. TDV92 at Jim Rome. Quote, Colby Lewis was in the right. The purity of the game is at stake. Signed, rally hats, rally monkeys, hot foots, bubble gum on the hat. Random dude, PDX at Jim Rome. Baseball's unwritten rules are like one direction hashtags. Only people really into it really care about them. Anders in Fargo at Jim Rome. Have you seen the latest picture of Leonardo DiCarbio? Bench the salt. Whoa. I have now. Bench the salt. Maybe it's for a role. If it's like a a Bioc, if it's a Dom DeLuise documentary, he looks like the fat guy from The Hangover. Fat! Galfinakis. He's rocking the beard. He's got the big gut. Damn, Leo, what up? I it's got to be for a role. Myself. Has to be for a role. Wolfpack. Method actor has to be for a role. There's no way that guy lets himself go like that. You know, even if you're the kind of guy like you walk around between fights, or in this case, rolls up and down 20, 30 pounds, it's going to get old, man. Much easier to stay in shape, to get in shape, if your body is your moneymaker. I mean, he looks like Galifianakis in that picture. That's your Twitter contest. Per usual, nobody wins. Good thing there's no prize. Looking ahead to tomorrow, Matt Holiday joins us. Padres all-star pitcher Tyson Ross also joins us, and I will look for a third. Also, a quick reminder, Rome on CBS Sports Network is back. We had last week off. We're back on today, and I've got a tweeted segment. Tweet me at Jim Rome. Best tweets get read on the air. Time for the huge call brought to you today by 5-Hour Energy. Turn your favorite 5-Hour Energy concoction into a share of 100 grand. For more details, visit 5HourYummification.com. I said 100 grr. Go to 5HourYummification.com. A lot of good calls today, but this one had to be the best. But I'm not going to talk about anybody in specific. I, I'll say, you know, we've, we've always been active in July. We've, we've, except for one year, I've been here. This is my ninth, my ninth year here. And the other eight, I think seven of the eight, we've always been active as, as buyers. One year we were a seller when we traded Raphael for Kyle to St. Louis. So we're always in the market. There's fewer teams that are in the market to trade right now, and you have to have not only the team to trade. Second wild card changes dynamics a lot. Uh, you have to have the team that's got the player that, that you're seeking, you've got to have the matchup, you've got to have a lot of different things. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about high-end players, but I would, I would be sure that the high-end players are truly available before everybody speculates on who's going where and, and how it's all going to go, because it's, it's a, the, the rumor mill at this point in the season is far different than the reality. And I think that that's, you know, it's, it's great for the game that everybody talks the game and talks about if this guy's going to get traded or who he's going to go for. They should do this or they should do that. That is a beautiful part of baseball, maybe better than any other sport that we, that we all watch. But reality and, and rumor are, to me, far different worlds. And if somebody ever wanted to keep track of rumor versus what actually has happened or at least been conversed on, I think the percentage would be so low of what the reality truly was, I think people would be shocked by it. Ned Clay saying that all the rumor and speculation leading up to the trade deadline is, quote, a beautiful part of baseball. Let me translate that for you. I hate that crap, and people should shut up and just let me do my job. And Cole Hamels may or may not be available. David Price may or may not be available. Dodgers GM, longtime GM, Ned Coletti. Buffalo Bills head coach, Doug Marone. Want to thank the XR 4 ti Kyle Brandt, Dave Whelan, Alvin DeLauro. And again, we are back on TV on CBS Sports Network, 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 Pacific. Tweet at Jim Rome for our tweeted segment. And I will see you over there and then right back here tomorrow. Thank you for listening. We are out.